Uh, the year is 2004. Uh, I've just released my first uh, DVD special. I am significantly fatter um, and I guess I'm a better performer now than I was then, but some of the jokes are still funny. Uh, please enjoy. Hello. I was here last night and I did a few shows, so today's a bit it's easier. This is the audience without the audience in. Oh, look. Gary's yeah, a little room. It's all right. And there's a lot of people that are involved over there. Backstage. I'm not, I'm not really sure what backstage footage is meant to involve. Um, I'm going to do a couple of lines of coke in a minute and probably fuck a supermodel. Definitely had a key to this dressing room. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I don't want anyone to be watching this and thinking, Christ, those stars, they've got an amazing life, haven't they? Because look at their lifestyle and everything. Yeah. Come in. There's people in prison that spend their days in nicer rooms than this. Those are Apple Danish things. I'm quite fond of those. I don't know if this is the same stuff that Hitler used on his hair. Probably. It's a similar sort of cut. Um, that's Hannah, she's my manager. Yeah, eating you want any grapes. questions, ask her. It's only 15% of the fruit. <laughs> yeah, should we make it interactive? Press the red button there if you've got a question about management. Uh, makeup, come on. Hello. How are you? Right. I broke the fan. You broke the fan? Don't touch it. <laughs> I just got one of the guys to cobble it together. Okay. Yeah. Can you feel it? The budget for this DVD is pretty high because <laughs> That's the air we've got in the, in the air-conditioned basement of this massively hot building in June. We've got a fan. And I broke it. Yeah, so, do you buy the makeup in the pound shop as well? Yes. I want the full Dale. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna, that's what you're going to have. On a full day. <laughs> on another face painted on top of mine. Nearly done. Does this make me gay? <laughs> or is it the cocks in the arse? Which one is it? It's the way to the stage. Hi there, you're Because you're not using the... Stick the other lens on, give me one sec. Yeah, stick another lens on. Okay, that might be good for the back cover, you never know. Can I get these trousers changing? You know the ones that the Chippendales have got that just rip off? Nice. Can I get those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to go now, I'll call you back. <laughs> she doesn't have to do this, you know, she's on the game. <laughs> Make more money. Would you? Yeah. Would mm. you? I do! <laughs> Would I? <laughs> I do! God. Well, <laughs> what you put on? Just hold that colour up to the... You wanted that, Dale. It's not not my, not the colour of my face, is it? Didn't you say Dale? No, I just hang on. Let's just have a look at that. That's the, that that the colour of my skin, and that's the colour <laughs> she's painting me. I've got that's to. bordering on racism, <laughs> is what that is. I'm basically being creative. Well, you know the black and white minstrel show's coming back. I could do that too. That you. is racist. That was bordering on to what we're playing with. That is just. <laughs> it's not really my. I mean, I have to work with these people, but what can you do? She used to do Jim Davidson. Oh, God. She refused, too left wing. <laughs> it's not as if a woman didn't ask me last night, is it a toupee? So. What was that all about? Well, my hair looks like a toupee. No, it doesn't. That's partly to do with you, isn't it? Not at all. Well, it is a bit. I like the toupee, though. Do you think it's quite sexy? Well, you've gone from sort of not admitting <laughs> it to sort of saying, well, there's a positive. Well, I just thought I'd better, you know, backtrack very quickly. Yeah, it does. It's great. So you're done. OK, I'll grab my jacket. I've got five minutes. Okay. And then I'll wander on and tell some jokes. Right. Now, what we've got here is a twin mic, because, you know, for security purposes, one or two mic packs. So, which makes me look like I've got a massively fat arse throughout proceedings. Not that I haven't got a fat arse, but, you know. Um, I've got the J-Lo booty going on there, if I'm not very much mistaken. Does that look all right? Is it straight? Yep, yeah, looks fine. Ish. Easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Easy, Tiger. Plenty of time for that. Never heard of foreplay. Thanks very much. But before we even before we even start, I suppose I'd better warn you. 
uh, that in my act there is a certain amount of bad language. I'm not talking about split infinitives. <laughs> there will be some swearing and there is some material of a sexual nature. So if you are offended by rude or crude material, for heaven's sake, don't be a cunt about it. <laughs> I was doing a gig a couple of weeks ago. I got talking to a girl in the front row. I asked her her name. She said it's Pataka. I said, that's an unusual name. You don't hear that every day. To which she replied, actually, I do. <laughs> I don't know, does anyone in here use Vodafone products by any chance? Anyone? Yeah. Mainly people over there. I imagine that's where the reception is best, is it? <laughs> I don't use Vodafone products, uh, not because they're not good products. I'm sure they're reasonably priced. I'm sure they work reasonably well. Um, but I don't use them because I don't like their advertising slogan. It's join the world's largest mobile community. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. That's the gypsies. <laughs> no offence to you. <laughs> if you want to dress in that manner and live in a lay-by, it's very much up to you. <laughs> Can't believe you went like that. <laughs> well done. Good. What's your name? Scott. Scott. Well, don't feel bad about everyone laughing at you, Scott. It's fine. <laughs> you and I both know they all need clothes pegs. There'll always be work for people like Scott to avoid. <laughs> My father used to say, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Till the accident. <laughs> Feminists say, and you may agree with this, you may not. Feminists say, a woman's work is never done. Maybe. If they got themselves organised, it'll be better. <laughs> it's a bit of an icy stare you give me there, madam. <laughs> what you've got to understand is that's postmodern misogyny. That joke is, in fact, steeped in irony. So don't you worry your pretty little head about it, love. <laughs> I had one of those serious relationship conversations the other week with my girlfriend where she sat me down and talked at me for about six hours. <laughs> I hadn't realised until then that when a man says he is spoken for, that is quite literally what he means. <laughs> she said to me, she said, Jimmy, we're at a crossroads in our relationship. Down one road is hard work and commitment, but ultimately, happiness. And down the other road, well, the other road is a dead end. And I said, that's not a crossroads, that's a T-junction. <laughs> well, I'm glad you laughed. She went fucking mental. <laughs> I should, I suppose, point out at this early stage in the, uh, in the show that uh, despite my dress and general demeanour, I'm not gay. <laughs> Unless you're from Newcastle. And by gay, you mean owns a coat. You're looking a bit disappointed there. Huh? <coughs> Sorry, it's just homosexuality isn't my thing. <laughs> no hard feelings. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't want to spoil the mood. I'm not, you know, I'm not homophobic. I'm not scared of you. <laughs> it's fine, you know, obviously some, some people are straight, some people are gay, that is fine. <laughs> I'm what you might call a stray. I'm straight, but I'm socially gay. Means I'll notice when a female friend changes her hair or buys new shoes, but I won't accept your cock in my ass. <laughs> it's less of a joke, it's just something I wanted to make absolutely clear. <laughs> I get the feeling from that look on your face that I may have misjudged this situation. <laughs> you, you either look hard or gay. <laughs> Hopefully, not both. <laughs> you look as if you want to take me outside. I'm not entirely sure why. Suppose either way I'm buggered. <laughs> As I'm sure you all would have ascertained, I'm quite middle class. And I'm from the home counties. So I don't have an accent. This is just how things sound when they're pronounced properly. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with being working class <laughs> these days. <laughs> being working class is very much like masturbation. It's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> of course, it's nothing to be proud of either. <laughs> and both give you calluses on your hands. <laughs> Sting, the popular singer, Sting's often bragging about his eight-hour night sex sessions with his wife, Trudy. Imagine how long he'd be able to keep it up if she was a looker. <laughs> In Japan, they believe that tiger penis improves fertility. But I think, if you really want to get pregnant, you're best off using a man's cock. <laughs> My best mate's girlfriend is six months pregnant. They said, you want to feel the baby? 
On reflection, I think they meant on the outside. <laughs> They say travel broadens the mind. Except with Americans, which tends to widen the arse. <laughs> a lot of people quote the fact that only 10% of Americans have passports. The thing is, they say it like it's a bad thing. <laughs> Don't get the wrong idea, I've got nothing against Americans. Just one came up to me after a show a couple of weeks ago and said he thought I was patronising. <laughs> I said, well, I think you'll find that's pronounced patronising. <laughs> it means when you talk down to someone. Don't worry, I'm not being condescending. I'm far too busy thinking about important things you wouldn't understand. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Did you know you're ten times more likely to get mugged in London than you are in New York City? It's because you don't live in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> See, my favourite news story of the last year came from America. I'm sure you all saw this story in the papers or on TV. It was a story about a man in Utah, an American man, who were, he was out rambling in the wilds of Utah, the beautiful desert landscape, and there was a rock fall, and he got his hand trapped underneath a massive boulder, and he had to sever his own hand in order to walk to freedom. Incredible story about human courage and spirit. Did you all see that story? Yeah. Well, I can't believe anyone saw it and didn't ask themselves the question, because I think it does beg the question, would I be able to do that? I've given it quite a lot of thought, and I think, yes, yes, I would be able to do that. What do I care about an American's hand? <laughs> if it's life or death, I'll cut his fucking head off. <laughs> The other story that sort of tickled me from America, not quite as inspiring, I'll be absolutely honest with you, was the story of an English woman and an American man. This made the papers earlier in the year. They were flying from JFK to London Heathrow, never met each other before, flying in first class. They just knew each other for eight hours, and they were arrested as they came into land at Heathrow. And the reason they were arrested was because the lady was fellating the man. I mean, sucking off. <laughs> yes, as they came into land, the lady was fellating the man. I, myself, prefer a boiled sweet. <laughs> I just can't quite imagine how that happened. <laughs> Presumably, at some point, she turned to him and said, my ears are popping. <laughs> Have you got a boiled sweet? <laughs> and he said, no, no, I haven't, but I've got an idea. <laughs> now, have we got anyone in from around the country? Is there anyone in from the north? Three. Oh, quite a few of you. Huh. I ask you, what's the point in having a north-south divide if you're not going to police it? It is a peculiarity of the United Kingdom that people from Liverpool tend to think people from Manchester are a bunch of cunts. <laughs> and vice versa, people from Manchester think people from Liverpool are a bunch of cunts. When will they realise? <laughs> Sorry, I, sh I should apologise, really, because I've used the C word rather a lot so far this evening, and uh, I know a lot of people, especially the ladies, let's be honest, find that a little bit offensive. There is, of course, an alternative to cunt. I don't mean up the arse. <laughs> now, are you all familiar with the phrase, see you next Tuesday? See, it's the polite English way of saying the C word so as not to cause too much offence. Although, ironically, I can't think of too many situations where you want to call someone a cunt, but you don't offend them. <laughs> sort of what I like about it. <laughs> I'll have a bit of a sit down, I think. Oh, you're all right. Was this the sort of thing you had in mind? No, right, OK, I'm fucked. <laughs> Who's come the furthest? Has anyone come from, like, a long way away, overseas? Canvey or... Island. Canvey Island? <laughs> right, now, I know Canvey Island, so I happen to know that you've not come a long way from your home. You've just brought it with you. <laughs> Did you come with him? <laughs> no, good. Canvey Island's the furthest anyone came. Well, fuck you. You were all in the area anyway, were you? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Was that Dover? <laughs> but you were castrated before you got a chance to... <laughs> right. <laughs> were you worried about sounding silly, so you thought, well, I'll put on a ludicrous high-pitched voice. <laughs> that should sort things out, shouldn't it? <laughs> so you're a sailor, are you? Imagine my surprise at your high-pitched voice. <laughs> mm. Bad things come in threes. A good example of that is Atomic Kitten. <laughs> Every time I think of Atomic Kitten, actually, I'm slightly saddened because I think, well, somewhere, 
Somewhere in the northeast, there's a supermarket three checkout girls short. <laughs> I wrote that joke for a thing called Worst Britons, where I had to write jokes about lots of celebrities. It was a programme that we put on Channel 4. I wrote this as well, if it's of any interest to you. <laughs> I went to a car boot sale the other week. I found this old, brown, bent, leathery tool. Turned out to be David Dickinson. <laughs> Now, I don't know if anyone's seen any of the other TV shows that I made. I make a show called Distraction at the moment. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. Oh, just about everyone. And one person liked it. <laughs> well, that's good. If I can entertain just one man, I'll have been shit. <laughs> the Distractions are quite good. It's, it's Channel 4's replacement to Sex in the City. <laughs> just imagine the city is Dundee and the sex is anal. You get the idea. <laughs> I, I do another show called Your Face or Mine. Has everyone seen that? Yeah. It's, it's quite good fun, I think. It's a fun show. It's as shallow as a tinker's bar. I mean, no offence, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's quite, it's quite a fun show. It's, it's basically about couples. It's about looks in relationships. Who, who here thinks looks are important in a relationship? Yeah. Oh, quite, quite a few of you being honest this evening. I sort of sit on the fence on that one. Are looks important in a relationship? Well, I mean, you don't look at the fireplace when you're poking the fire, do you? <laughs> But you do when it's sucking you off, so... <laughs> Are you two a couple? <laughs> do you mind me asking how on earth that happened? <laughs> what, was you, what, what were you thinking? You don't know. You do a lot better than that. You're punching way above your weight. <laughs> Not just a little bit, it's a different league. <laughs> well done. Is that money or personality or low self-esteem on her part? <laughs> Lovely little mix of all three. That's basically the, the show, Your Face or Mine. That's it. That's all we do. We'd string that out for half an hour, the magic of television. <laughs> Although it's quite awkward sometimes because there's quite young couples on the show and, you know, they're 19 or 20 and they're talking about their looks. It can be a bit, bit awkward sometimes. We had an incident on the show where a woman came on with a medical complaint. I'm not sure what the correct medical term is, but she had, well, she had a wonky face. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not the great medical term, but... <laughs> she wasn't an unattractive girl either. She was quite good-looking, but one half of her face was a lot lower than the other. Just a bit wonky. What had happened is she'd sent in a videotape to be on the show and recorded it rather coquettishly like that. <laughs> and then she turned up and gone like that, and we'd all gone like that. <laughs> and obviously the producer said, well, this is, a, you know, it's quite a serious thing. There's a show about looks and she's got a wonky face. We've got to at least address it for the audience. <laughs> I thought, what am I going to say? What's with the wonky face, love? <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I, I said, could you tell me about your face? And luckily, she played along. She said, yes, there's a story behind this. When I was 11, I had a skiing accident. I was skiing down the side of a, of a hill, and I, I skied into the side of a chalet. And I broke my leg and my arm and my jawbone and my cheekbone and my eye socket, and I had to be airlifted to hospital. And I said, at least you got to go in a helicopter. <laughs> Her face fell. <laughs> Sadly, it didn't even up. That would have been... <laughs> Rather miraculous. I can't be the only person. I mean, in real life, I do constantly put my foot in it. I can't be the only one that does these kind of things. But I mean, I, I'm, I've learned the hard way that you're not meant to refer to your partner as your current girlfriend. <laughs> it suggests you're looking for an upgrade. And that doesn't seem to keep them on their toes the way you would think it might. <laughs> oh, no, they don't like it. I've also got a policy now, after several unfortunate incidents, whereby I would rather see a pregnant woman standing on a bus than a fat girl sitting down crying. <laughs> Come on, we've all made that mistake, haven't we? <laughs> the worst thing is you know immediately you've made it. When's it due? Hang on, there's nothing due. <laughs> you just like your food. It's a terrible moment. You just want the earth to open up and swallow her. Obviously, it have to be a fucking big hole. <laughs> now, the other time when I put my foot in it, but sort of deliberately, is when I do charity shows. I do quite a lot of charity shows, and I'm not pretending to be particularly altruistic. I do them because they're really good fun. You get there's loads of comics come and do a show. There's now about ten of us backstage. We all hang out together. It's like a little social. And what we do is we dare each other. We dare each other to open with the most inappropriate line possible. <laughs> and what happens is I tend to win the bet and not get invited back. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, is a double win, because you don't get paid for those shows. 
I did a gig for the Ashling Foundation. Does anyone know the Ashling Foundation? No. Well, they're quite a small charity based in London. They're, um, they're an Irish charity, and what they do is they take Irish builders and, and navvies that came over in the 1950s and 60s, and uh, these are older guys. They've fallen on hard times. They give them pensions and retirement homes on the west coast of Ireland. And I did a gig for them. I thought it was a great charity. I went out there. I said, it's lovely to be here supporting the Ashling Foundation. I've got a new slogan for you. Fuck off home, the roads are finished. <laughs> Apparently, they're famous for their sense of humour. <laughs> oh, no, they're fucking not. <laughs> the other, uh, the other uh, charity that I did a gig for uh, last year was um, Stonewall. You know Stonewall, the largest gay charity in Europe? I did a gig for them up in Edinburgh. I went on, I said, it's lovely to be here in Edinburgh. I'm not sure about supporting Stonewall. Sure, maybe if we raise enough money, maybe one day we'll be able to find a cure. <laughs> but I'm not sure there's anything wrong with being gay. That was pretty much their reaction. <laughs> Although they were slightly more theatrical. <laughs> I don't want to sound callous or unkind or cruel, but the Children of Courage Awards. How much courage does it take to get poorly? <laughs> All I'm saying is, maybe we could just change the name to the Children of Horrible Misfortune. <laughs> That way, we could include ugly children as well. <laughs> if anyone's sitting there thinking, I really didn't like that joke, I don't like the subject matter, I didn't think it was very funny. Imagine how it went down at the Great Ormond Street Gala. <laughs> well, comedy's been pretty good to me over the last couple of years. I've had a really sort of good run at it. And I wanted to give something back. And what I thought I'd do is try and sort of put some, do some guerrilla comedy, put some comedy in places where you don't normally find it. Obviously, you all, you know, come out to a comedy show this evening, and people watching a comedy DVD tend to be in quite a good mood already. But what about the people that aren't having a good day? What about the people, I don't know, you know, reading the small ads? I mean, you can't be having a good time if you're reading the small ads. You're either buying something secondhand, or you're filling in a personal. And let's face it, if you're summing up your personality in 30 words or less, it basically means you don't have a good one. <laughs> so what I thought I'd do is put some, you know, I've got a credit card, I've got quite good phone manner. I'll play some small ads, maybe cheer some people up along the way. Would you like to see them? Yeah. Of course you fucking would. <laughs> this is the first one that I placed. I put it in the, uh, in the personals. It's um, incurable romantic, seeks filthy hall. <laughs> <laughs> this one's slightly more optimistic than that. It's a bit more ambitious. Albino he, she, seeks similar. Now, I've not had any responses to that as yet. <laughs> but as soon as I get two, I'm going to set up a blind date. They won't be able to believe their luck. <laughs> this next one's sort of the basis for all small ads, in my opinion, in the personals. Good-looking, athletic, Notting Hill-based movie star, millionaire, seeks gullible stunner. Now, the business opportunity section of, uh, of papers, I, I travel up and down the country doing lots of stand-up gigs, and I always sort of read the local paper. It's normally, you know, quite good fun. The business opportunity section, useless for me. Unless you want to buy a cafe in Solihull, no good. <laughs> so I thought I'd try and brighten up with an ad. I placed this. Small minority wanted to spoil it for the rest of us. <laughs> There's always one, is it you? Now, sadly, I didn't get any responses at all to this next one. <laughs> Wanted, 30 Chinamen and a Zeppelin for elaborate practical joke. <laughs> now, the announcement section in a local paper should be an interesting thing, but it's not. It's births, marriages and deaths. But, of course, if you know, if you know the person you know, involved in either being born or getting married or dying, you sort of know. You don't need to read it in the paper. So it's a bit pointless. Although my nan used to collect anything to do with our family or friends, she used to collect all the little personals from the local paper and put them in a shoebox. She collected them all for like 50 years. And then she died and we popped them in the bin. <laughs> that's not a joke, that's just what happens. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd try and, you know, cheer up the announcement section of the paper. I went with this ad. Amanda, I'm running a bit late. <laughs> We'll be there in about an hour. 
how far apart are the contractions? <laughs> this next one is, well, it's just plain odd, but I ended up putting it in public and legal notices, but only because I was out of ideas as to where to put it. Nemesis wanted. <laughs> I'm five foot ten into kayaking, books and conversation by day. Justice, honour and vengeance by night. <laughs> Seeking arch enemy, possibly crime lord or deformed megalomaniac. <laughs> this next one's not my finest piece of work, but I, I kind of like it. Speech impediment. There's a new support group for the London area called <laughs> Now, obviously, we set up all of these with, with real phone lines so people could call up if they wanted to. And we, we put an extra long answer machine message tape for that one because we thought if we get any complaints, it could take a while. <laughs> this next one doesn't have a phone number. I just wanted to get the message out there. Does anyone else think there's something not quite right about Gary Lineker? <laughs> this next one, uh, well, might be handy for some of the front row. I put it in the lost section. Lost. Virginity. Yes, get in. <laughs> Does anyone here read Private Eye magazine? Oh, quite, quite a few of you. Right. Well, you can attest to the fact that these small ads in the back of Private Eye are mental. <laughs> They're the most mental thing I've seen. It's full of people saying things like, I'm just doing a law degree and I need £5,000 to complete my thesis. And then bank account details. <laughs> it's the Everest of optimism. I thought I'm getting in on that action. I placed this. Needed, 20k, no questions asked. <laughs> then two weeks later, when no one came up with the money, terrible, I put, all right, 10k, one question, nothing personal. <laughs> I'm willing to compromise, I'm a reasonable man. Now, there's a for sale section in all of these magazines around the country. Hitachi washing machine, DX250, under warranty until, kill, 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 kill them all. <laughs> February 2004, in perfect working order, £180 on nearest offer. The reason I'm so pleased with that is because I phoned it in. <laughs> and the only thing the operator said to me was, is that four kills? <laughs> yeah, fine. For sale, holiday photos, choice of ski, sun or city break. <laughs> Ideal for anecdote or alibi. For sale, bonsai tree, large. <laughs> the other thing I've got quite interested in, nay, obsessed by, is the, uh, you know the adverts you get at busy, on railings, at busy intersections in roads? Up and down the country you get them all over the place. You've all seen those, yeah? Well, what kind of nutters are replying to those? What well, people are out of work and they're thinking, yeah, the railings, that's the answer. <laughs> Not a job centre or a friend of a friend. I'll just go with the railing. Anyway, uh, you know, so I thought what I'll do is I'll, I'll set up some of my own, I'll put them up around West London, and I'll see who calls. Nut as it turns out. <laughs> I need to bother my arse. But I'll take you through some of the ones that I did anyway. Get rich quick. Simply set up a premium rate phone line. To find out how, just call 0900. <laughs> Lose weight fast. Fed up of dieting and exercise, incredible results guaranteed. Try amoebic dysentery. <laughs> Is your memory letting you down? And what about your memory? Is it letting you down? <laughs> Call for an information pack right now, before you forget. Money worries. Work from home. Earn pounds. You don't even have to get out of bed. To find out more, just call Pimp Jimmy. <laughs> well, this is the last one of these. Am you grammar letting me down? <laughs> Tuition available. Now call now. I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you, but I split up with my last girlfriend because she was very hypocritical. She used to say, I love surprises, but then when she found out I was sleeping with her sister. 
My girlfriend always says, you never tell me how much you love me. I don't want to upset her. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we were making love, and she had, well, she had an asthma attack. I did briefly think I was doing really rather well. <laughs> then about sort of the 90-second, two-minute mark, I thought, hang on, she's laying this on a bit thick. <laughs> Either she wants something or she's not well. And she wasn't well. I totally panicked. I didn't know what to do. So I phoned a friend of mine who's a doctor and he lives just down the road from me, and I said to him, you know, what should I do? He said, well, yeah, don't panic. It could be quite serious. It probably isn't, but I'll pop right over. I said, what should I do in the meantime? He said, finish yourself off. <laughs> don't give me that look. It was the right thing to do. I realised I shouldn't really take the piss out of the asthmatics. They've got enough to worry about. The National Asthmatics Emergency Helpline Service was shut down recently. Apparently a problem with all the obscene phone calls. <laughs> Not asthmatics in? <laughs> no, I would have heard you. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's got this. In, uh, there are lots of couples in this evening. How many couples do we have? Quite a few. By, by show of hands. How many do we have by shouting out? Hundreds. Brilliant. <laughs> wondering, does anyone have this arrangement in their relationship? It's becoming ever more common now for couples to have an arrangement whereby they're totally faithful to each other, but they've got a clause whereby if one of them was to meet a certain celebrity, they would be allowed to stray. <laughs> Has anyone got that going on in their relationship? Who have you got? I notice that you're sitting next to a lady. <laughs> you're going to do what when you go home? She's going to kill you? Yeah. Right. Or strap one on and fuck you, certainly. <laughs> one or the other. Anyone else got one? You've got one. Who have you got? Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey? <laughs> All right. <laughs> he might be up for it. And who's your boyfriend got? Anything, I'm not bothered. <laughs> what a, sorry? Anything good looking? What, a bit of a change? Yeah, lovely. <laughs> you can't say that. The reason I mention it is because I've got an arrangement with my girlfriend whereby if I ever get the opportunity to sleep with Kylie Minogue, she can fuck off. <laughs> Are you all aware of what snowballing is? The sexual practice snowballing? Yeah. One bloke down. <laughs> Who was that down there? Quite proud of that. Well done. <laughs> Everyone else, none the way. Okay, well, I'll explain. It says something about you. <laughs> snowballing is a sexual practice where having administered oral sex, your partner doesn't spit or swallow so much as return to sender via a kiss. <laughs> oh, you're looking shocked and appalled as I explain that to you. Let me assure you, I found out the hard way. <laughs> And it does raise an interesting moral dilemma. <laughs> Should you spit or swallow? <laughs> well, if you really love yourself. <laughs> so I can see some friends of mine up there. And you're explaining that to your mum. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a brilliant day out that will be. <laughs> what a lovely drive home. So this snowballing thing. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. Are there any Catholics in, by any chance? Yeah. You're up there, oh, if you're up there. I'm a lapsed Catholic. I don't know much about Catholicism, but I like some of the ideas. Very much like the idea of the Confirmation. The Confirmation, correct me if I'm wrong, is when you're about 12 and you meet a bishop. And he says to you, you're definitely a Catholic. I don't know if he does that. But he says, you're definitely a Catholic. He confirms you. You are confirmed. I think it's a very good idea. I think other religions could do with that. I think the Jews could do with that. I've got a lot of friends that are Jews, and they always say, I'm Jewish. <laughs> A new book's come out called Better Than Sex with Claire Rayner. <laughs> a lot of things in that fucking category. <laughs> I'm struggling to think of anything that wouldn't make the mark. <laughs> I suppose the Rwandan genocide might just edge it. <laughs> well, good. I was in a bookstore last week. There was a third of all titles. What the Lion, the Witch. <laughs> I said to the PhD English graduate, sorry, shop assistant. <laughs> I said to her, I said, what's this? What's this psycho the rapist section? She said, I think I'll find that's pronounced psychotherapist. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know if you're all aware of this. Are you all aware of the fact that, um, that Christopher Reeve wrote a book last year? He wrote a book called Nothing is Impossible. I say he wrote it, he dictated it. It's not important. <laughs> Just on the back flyleaf cover of the book, it says, since the accident, Christopher's never looked back. <laughs> I mean, fair enough, but there's no need to rub it in, is there? <laughs> I met an incredible girl on the internet. Smart, sexy, uninhibited. Of course, it turned out to be a 12-year-old paraplegic boy. <laughs> I'll be honest, the sex was disappointing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think we've reached a barrier there, haven't we? <laughs> And we will laugh at that and nothing more. <laughs> well, fair enough. A couple of weeks ago, I failed to perform sexually. <laughs> well, how is that a laughing matter? <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I failed to perform sexually. I'm not going to go into detail. Suffice it to say, I arrived early. My girlfriend said, don't worry, that happens to a lot of guys. I said, right, there's two things that matter with that. <laughs> Firstly, who are these a lot of guys? <laughs> and secondly, if it's happening to more than one of us, don't you think it could be your fault? <laughs> She says there's never an excuse to raise your hand to a woman. What if you've got a question? <laughs> she says that because she's a woman, she's good at doing two things at the same time. If that's the case, why is the threesome out of the question? <laughs> I was in the high street the other day. There was, there was a girl there with a clipboard. She said, could you spare a few minutes for cancer research? I said, all right, but we're not going to get much done. <laughs> we could pop into boots and see if they've got anything. <laughs> You know that disclaimer they put at the end of films? You know the one that says the characters and the events in this film are purely fictitious, any relation to real characters and events is purely coincidental? Yeah? Do they really need that on Lord of the Rings? <laughs> is anyone watching that thinking, this is a brilliant documentary? <laughs> I might think about going to New Zealand on my holidays. <laughs> but wait, no, I don't want it ruined by Saruman, he's Orc Army. <laughs> Your hair. What, I'm just saying. I'm just, I, I like the Spice Girls as much as the next man, but... <laughs> it's a... no, it's... Hmm. I can't help noticing you've got a tattoo on your... A, well, it's your boob, isn't it, really? <laughs> it sort of draws the eye. What is that, exactly? It's a rose. On your... As if boobs aren't fun enough as they are. <laughs> She's thought, I'll tell you, I'll brighten these things up. No fella's gonna like these. What do guys like? They like flowers, don't they? Yeah, I'll get a <laughs> picture of a flower. Did you not think, what, what do you like? What kind of thing? You look like the sort of bloke that like cars and guns and tanks. <laughs> get a nice tattoo of a tank on your tip. <laughs> Lovely. He could be, you know, and going, oh, is that a Sherman? Because <laughs> flowers, unless he's secretly gay, and I'll be honest, there's a lot of earrings and spiky hair. Good, fine. I remember before J-Lo, before the term ghetto booty, when we used to just call it a fat ass. <laughs> of course, J-Lo's had her bum insured for $10 million. Don't know if that covers contents. <laughs> I was talking to my nan about Ant and Deck. She said she didn't know which one Ant was. I said, do you know which one Deck is? She said, yeah. <laughs> My girlfriend asked me recently one of, the, one of the big questions in life. She said to me, do you want to have children? I thought about it. I thought, God, is there any truer expression of the love that you have for another person than to have a child with them? Because really, that is a bond that lasts forever. It's not like getting married. Marriages break up. But having a child together, you know you're going to be bonded through that child for the rest of your life. And then I thought about the money. I thought, well, how expensive is it bringing up a child? It's apparently the most expensive thing you can do. It costs £100,000 to bring up a child up to the age of 18. It's an incredible amount of money. It's not like buying a house where you can sell it on. It doesn't appreciate, that's just gone. <laughs> and then I thought about the education of the child. Would I send it to state school or private school? I'm doing all right. I might think about private school, but I'd probably end up sending it to state school. And then, you know, maybe I'd compromise on that, become a bit of a hypocrite, end up reading the Daily Mail, going to parent-teacher meetings, <laughs> becoming my dad. It'd be awful. And then I thought, I thought more about, well, why am I thinking about having a child? Why don't I think about adopting a child? Isn't it just about the family unit and love rather than just having a little mini-me running around the place? And then, then I thought about how much it would mean to, to have my family name live on and, you know, what that would mean to my, my nearest and dearest. And then, then I thought again about the relationship with my girlfriend, how that would change, how I'd probably end up calling her mum or something, you know, be, would really sort of change that. And then you know, it would change my life and probably ruin it. Uh, anyway, I sort of weighed up all the pros and all the cons, and, and in the end, I said no. 
Of course, by then I'd come. <laughs> Luckily, all over her tits. <laughs> Mum understood that? Good. <laughs> Fine, right. <laughs> You know, ladies and gentlemen, one of my ambitions is to, is to write a book. Like many comedians, I, I'd love to write a book, but I don't really want to write a novel, because I don't know if you've ever read a novel by a comedian, but they're shite. <laughs> we don't seem very good at it, but, you know, it requires having an idea that lasts more than 30 seconds. <laughs> Not going to happen. So what I thought I'd do is a, is a book of correspondence, because that way you're getting someone else to do half the work. <laughs> oh, yeah, always thinking. Would you like to hear them? Yeah. Well, good, good, otherwise we'd be having some quiet time. <laughs> This is, the, this is the first letter that I wrote. It's to my, uh, my local MP, uh, Chris Smith. Dear Mr Smith, do you get tired of people writing to you who are clearly just wasting your time and have nothing better to do? <laughs> this is to uh, Charlie Statham, who's the head doctor of NHS Direct in West London. Dear sir, I heard about a doctor that took out someone's appendix with a coat hanger on a plane. Now, I'm not a qualified doctor, but I do take an interest and I've got all the proper kit. <laughs> Could you talk me through the procedure? <laughs> Please write back soon, she's in terrible pain. <laughs> Is anyone in here a member of Amnesty International? I think someone's timidly put up a hand at the back. But are you worried about being persecuted? <laughs> Well, I, I wrote a letter to the head of Amnesty International in the UK. I hope you like it. It's to Kate Allen, director of Amnesty International UK. Dear Madam, I like what you people do. <laughs> Writing letters to complain about human rights violations is like a political version of points of view. <laughs> the BBC, or fascist leader, may not change what they do as a result, but at least you'll slow down their day as they wade through the post bag. <laughs> I'd be surprised if they got round to torturing anyone before 11.30, the number of letters you send. <laughs> Lots of people do nothing because they know they cannot change the world. But you good people are not deterred from making futile gestures on behalf of human rights. And I, for one, applaud you. Inspired by your unilateral approach, I decided to hold a fundraising dinner on your behalf at my home. I charge people £20 a head to come and enjoy a meal and drinks with all profits to go to Amnesty. Although a success creatively, we went for a South American theme, Unfortunately, the groceries were expensive, as was the booze, and in the end, I made a loss. <laughs> you now owe me £57.40. <laughs> now, Amnesty, God bless them, got back to me almost immediately with this letter. To be honest, it's a little bit condescending. Dear Jimmy, thank you for your letter. I was delighted to hear that you're a supporter of Amnesty. You do appear to have a few misunderstandings about the work we do. So I've enclosed a copy of our new information leaflet, what we do. <laughs> Which, fair enough, is a very good name for an information leaflet. I've also enclosed a copy of our new annual review, Human Rights Before Profit. Which I've had a flick through and is no way to run a company. Regarding your recent fundraising dinner, I'm sorry to hear that all the energy and creativity which you put into your event did not result in you being able to make your planned fundraising donation. I usually advise our supporters to start small and build up with their fundraising. It's also an excellent idea to work out a simple budget beforehand. <laughs> and to have a think about just how many people you can attract as guests to your event. This helps immeasurably with planning your expenditure and setting your ticket price and hopefully will ensure a different outcome at your next fundraiser. In terms of your request that Amnesty reimburse you for the loss, I'm afraid I will have to say no. <laughs> well, I was very disappointed and £57.40 out of pocket. But I had a money-making idea. Who buys fair trade products here? Anyone? Quite a few of you buy fair trade. You know, the tea, the coffee, the sugar, that kind of thing. I had a bit of, you know, I think I spotted a gap in the market, so I wrote them a letter. The reason I'm writing is I think I've spotted a gap in the market. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> no one is more exploited than the farmer of the coca leaf. Whilst drug barons get rich exploiting both third world farmers and first world <laughs> recreational users, we stand by and do nothing. I propose a fair trade cocaine joint venture. <laughs> I have a contact in distribution. <laughs> and you guys have the perfect cover to sell through customs. Who knows, if it all takes off, we could end up millionaires. <laughs> Brackets and help the poor.
I wrote this one to Martin Bell. You know Martin Bell, the man in the white suit political campaigner? Dear Mr Bell, your personal assistant is keeping things from you. <laughs> now, I've not had a reply to that, which would seem to suggest I'm right. <laughs> this is one that I wrote to, in terms of taste and decency, we take a bit of a dark turn here, let's be honest. Um, it's a letter that I wrote to David Yelland when he was editor of The Sun. Dear Yelland. <laughs> I thought that was good, tabloidy strong. Dear Yelland, there's been a lot of talk about genetic engineering. Obviously, it's a very complex area. Could you tell me, is it wrong to breed piglets specifically for the purpose of weaning paedophiles off babies? <laughs> Only I'm thinking of starting a company with the slogan, they'll squeal, but not to the cops. <laughs> I think it's morally acceptable to write that letter. I think it's OK to laugh, but to applaud, really. That's in very fine text. <laughs> I wrote this to Sir John Stevens, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Dear Sir John, I've got a bet on with a friend. I say most policemen are just nice guys doing their job, whereas he says all coppers are cunts. <laughs> Which is it? <laughs> right, what should we do here? Uh, well, very much your decision. Um, I wrote a letter to Stephen Hawking. Would you like to hear it? Fine. <laughs> On your own heads be it. <laughs> okay, it's Stephen Hawking in Cambridge University. Dear Professor, I know you get lots of letters asking you all sorts of things about the nature of the universe, and I also know you don't have a lot of time on your hands to be answering all of them in great detail. But perhaps this question from my nine-year-old will inspire you a little. He is severely disabled and has similar limitations to you, but equally he has a great spirit and refuses to give in on a world all too ready to dismiss him as a four-eyed, monotonal, voice-box, wheelchair-bound freak. <laughs> anyway, what he'd really like to know is, would you like to come over and play? <laughs> now, obviously, when you send a letter like that, you're not expecting a reply. You're certainly not expecting a phone call. <laughs> but that's what I got. My younger brother, Patrick, answered the phone and passed it to me. He said, it's Stephen Hawking's assistant. I was slightly taken aback. <laughs> she was inquiring as to the name of my son. Now, the only disability my son has is, tragically, he's fictitious. <laughs> but as I said, my younger brother, Patrick, had answered the phone, so I said, Patrick. I uh, gave a name, and then she asked about his disabilities, and I, you know, watch a fair amount of daytime TV, I was able to cobble something together. <laughs> And the reason I did that was not to sort of continue the joke. I just thought, well, she'll be embarrassed on the phone if I say it's just a silly joke. So I thought, well, I don't want to embarrass her. I'll just say it. That'll probably be the end of it. But it wasn't the end of it at all. Uh, about two weeks later, I received this letter, a lovely letter. And she sent me a biography of Stephen Hawking with a photo. It's not signed. <laughs> and then about a week after that, I got this letter from Stephen Hawking himself. It's absolutely genuine. I'll read it to you now. <coughs> Dear Patrick, my assistant, Karen, has sent me a letter from your father who tells me that you've invited me to come over and play. <laughs> it's very kind of you to send me the invitation, but unfortunately, I'm teaching at Caltech in Pasadena until the 1st of May. <laughs> so I can't take you up on your offer. Even though I am 60, I think it's never too late to play. One of my birthday treats was to go for a balloon ride, and that was really exciting. If you're interested, contact Ian Bentley at Innovative Ballooning. Has the contact details and phone numbers and things. I did contact him, and he'd bought us a balloon ride. <laughs> I did briefly consider crippling my younger brother to take him <laughs> out of the office. <laughs> I just, the reason I, I, I sort of share that with you, ladies and gentlemen, is because, you know, it's all a bit clever, clever, sending people, you know, letters and kind of running away. But that one went horribly wrong. <laughs> And I also thought it demonstrated that Stephen Hawking is not only a brilliant man, but a brilliant bloke. What a lovely thing to do. You know, for, you know he, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Having said that, responding to a letter where you yourself are described as a four-eyed, monotonal, <laughs> voice box, wheelchair-bound freak, maybe not that clever. <laughs> well, this is the last letter. It's a letter I wrote to HSBC. Anyone back with HSBC? Yeah. Oh, quite a few of you. All right, this is the letter I wrote to them. Dear sir or madam, I really love your latest HSBC commercials, the ones about cultural diversity and the importance of communicative sensitivity in international finance. Having said that, I must take issue with the statement you make that the rudest thing you could do in Thailand was to reveal the soles of your feet. 
Now, I've been to Thailand <laughs> in my year off, and I can tell you, you can do things a lot ruder than that there. <laughs> a lot ruder. My friend Keith shat in a hooker's mouth for a tenner. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know, in case you were thinking about doing another ad. <laughs> about Holland or something. Has anyone ever watched the special features on a live comedy DVD? Four people, and they, they sound long-term unemployed. <laughs> you can tell a lot from a voice. I bought this for 6 99 in a petrol station. I'm getting value. <laughs> Marvellous. All right. Uh, well, uh, so you'd like to interview me, Heidi? Brilliant. Well, welcome. Come on up. Give a round of applause, honey. <laughs> Have a little sit down. Oh, right, yeah? Yeah, round of applause for Josh. Have a sit down. There's some questions there for you. Hey, Brad. Hello, mate. How are you? Yeah, very well. Have a sit down. Yeah. Hang on. First of all, who are you? Um, my name's Heidi. Your name's Heidi? Yes. Right. Is there anything else? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. What do you do? I'm a teacher. Right. And what do you teach? And if you say children, I'll hit you. <laughs> <laughs> I teach primary school children. Primary school? Yes. Now, I don't know much about teaching. But I would imagine it's the teachers that aren't as good that get primary school. <laughs> as they, they don't know as much stuff. Is that what happens? Quite possibly, yes. Right. I always thought I could be a special needs teacher. <laughs> How tough could it be? <laughs> the little fellas. I mean, it's not as if... Do, they get, do you get paid on... Is it performance-related pay for no. teachers? Oh, I thought they were trying to bring that in. Special needs people would be fucked, wouldn't they? <laughs> Just talk me through the look, though. This a good look? It's a, it's a fine look, yeah. Good, good. It's particularly American. Uh, well, seeing as the world is being enveloped by America at the moment, I think that's probably the right way to go. <laughs> Word. <laughs> yeah, John. Mm. Try stuff. What, what do you do? Uh, I work in a Virgin Megastore. Which one? Uh, the one in Hounslow. Nice. No, it's not. <laughs> OK. But really, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. Really, you're a filmmaker? Yeah, I'm an independent filmmaker. Right. Um, <laughs> by saying Are these that, films I... with your girlfriend, or...? Uh, she's... <laughs> what she's... kind of films? We all make films. <laughs> uh, cheap comedies, basically. Cheap comedies? Yes. Channel 5 kind of stuff. Uh, well, if only they'd be shown on television, but for some reason no one will buy them yet. All right. Are one. they funny? I like to think so. What kind of thing? Uh, first one was a uh, zombie comedy set at my school when I was in the sixth form a couple of years ago. Um, about <laughs> four years ago, specifically. Um, then yeah, four years ago. I think they laughed when you said a couple of years ago. They went, hang on. <laughs> He's 20, that must be... Mm. Well, in Hounslow. Yeah. yeah. So a zombie comedy? Yes. Uh, called Brilliant. School of the Dead. School um, of the Dead, I think you've done. Yes, and then it was... <laughs> yeah. fact, Simon Pegg did the same thing, made millions, so fair enough. I, I did it years before Shaun of the Dead came out. I love Simon Pegg, I'm a big fan, I'm, I'm going to see him at a comedy show next, in a couple of weeks. And I saw him at the Albert Hall, where you played the same thing, a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly stalkerish, but good. Good, I wild to, so you, is it a full-length film about zombie school? Yeah, it was an hour and a half. It's over long. I did my second one, which was a James Bond spoof. That was two hours, ten minutes. Way too long. Even I can't sit through it now. Yeah. And, um, the actual James Bond film is less... <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're either from France or a burglar. It's <laughs> <laughs> my only frame of reference. <laughs> what do you do, Brad? Just quickly uh, tell me. Student. You're a student? Yeah. And what do you study? English literature. Really? It's a shame. <laughs> Who's your favourite writer? Um, Dickens, probably. Dickens? <laughs> yeah, I think about that one. Yeah. Is he from West Africa? <laughs> Dickens. <laughs> yeah, I think I might know him, yeah. <laughs> what is your most embarrassing moment? Probably when I first met my girlfriend, I, I met her parents. Yeah, you know, when you go out to... I presume everyone's done this. You've gone out to dinner with, with your girlfriend's parents and it's the most anodyne, boring conversation you've ever had in your life. It's a terrible thing. And we were having that boring conversation. We got onto sports. I thought, we're safe enough on sport. And Caroline's mother, out of nowhere, said, of course, Caroline can get both her legs behind her head. <laughs> and there was a bit of an awkward silence, I'll be honest, <laughs> in which I nearly bit my tongue off. <laughs> and her father broke the silence with the rather epic, when would that come in handy? How do you relax? 
I put Smarties tubes onto cats' legs and make them walk like a robot. <laughs> <laughs> If I'm feeling really stressed, I'll make him go down the stairs. <laughs> you ever done that? Make a film about that. I will. Robotic cat. Robocats. Robocats, there you go. Yeah. Sorted. So, as long as you're The product in. placement is there. Yeah. Well, we'd have to tape them up. I've had to tape up things in my films because if they ever get used, I'll be sued. Tesco's almost did me once. Tesco's nearly sued you? Yeah. Yeah, of course they did, yeah. They did? Yeah. yeah. I, They're I, very worried. <laughs> I'd the six mates of yours that saw the film. <laughs> they could see Tesco's in a bad light. I, I promoted them and they didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that I used their name. Right. Anything. <laughs> 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 what book changed your life? Heidegger's Being in Nothingness. Before I got that book, we had a wonky table in the kitchen. <laughs> that was a great look from an English student. Though. <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> Did it? <laughs> All the best with that. Are you uh, all right? Are you, are you nervous up here? Yeah, very. Yeah. Really? I don't be. Mean, it's quite a nice audience. You sit and relax, you know, take it in. It's quite scary. It's not every day you get to come on stage. It's good fun. That's just an audience. Don't panic. It'll be fine. You, look, you get, get them to applaud. Go like that. Go on. Power. <laughs> 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 it's so lucky you did that. <laughs> he would have been scarred for life. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> 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 What is your favourite record of all time? Hop, skip, jump. <laughs> Who's that boy? Who's that boy? I think it was Colin Jackson, I'm not sure. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I clearly didn't get that, did I? Well, you see, there's records, like, like <laughs> records that you play, right? And what I've done, hmm, you'll never... <laughs> I'm a whack. I've inferred, like, a, like an Olympic record. That's, that's what the joke was there. <laughs> is your school one of the ones that's failing? Or... <laughs> <laughs> what makes you angry? When I can't get the lid off the Valium. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if you know what questions I'm going to ask, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which historical figure do you most admire? Joan of Arc, lovely tits. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing. Go on, Joan of Arc. <laughs> she was only 15, steady on. <laughs> what's, what's the one thing you'd like to do before you die? Kylie. <laughs> she looks like she's 15, then, doesn't she? Easy. Well, we're not on yeah. a web chat room now. <laughs> <laughs> Kylie looks like she's 15. <laughs> Does she? No, I don't know. She's got quite a boyish bum, I suppose. Never looked at 15-year-old boys' bums. <laughs> they used to have one, presumably. But I can't see it. <laughs> you never... Never had a look. Stand up. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not, not unlike Kylie's bomb, I'm sure. Very pert, well done. <laughs> um, any questions of your own? <laughs> <laughs> we nearly carried that off without anyone. Yeah, he's just, he's just having a look at that bloke's bum and see what's like. Do you wear a toupee? Do I wear a toupee? Yeah. No. <laughs> you can have a go and test it, it's real if you want. I realise it's a slightly anachronistic haircut that I've got. It's, it's a bit Hitler. <laughs> I like it, you know. And let's face it, the trains ran on time. <laughs> Fair enough, they all went to death camps, but <laughs> he made an effort. Um... Oh, that split the audience. Uh, the people with no sense of moral decency left, and the others. <laughs> Have you got any other um, questions? I can't think of any offhand. You can't think honest. of any offhand. No. Would you like to appear in one of my films? I would love to. <laughs> Shall I give you my number? Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> thank you very much for talking to me, Tim. Well, thank you very much indeed, Heidi. Round of applause for Heidi, I think. <laughs> thank you very much. That was lovely. Thanks very much, Jeff. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a little list of questions. What's your name? Oh, I don't make up my own questions. You can make up your own, yeah. <laughs> Feel free. Um, my name is Blonard. Blonard? Yeah. It's Irish. It's Irish for what? Typo? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it's Irish for. What is it Irish for? Flower. That's it, yeah. Flower? <laughs> yeah. What kind of flower? Little flower. Not self-raising? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. 
Little flower. Little flower, yeah. Blonde. It's, it's not difficult, yeah. Is it, is it spelled... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, fair enough. All right, little flower. <laughs> but I just worry on the DVD, if you, you know, if you're watching this back home, I can pronounce blonde. <laughs> Why? Blonde. <laughs> Go ahead. Kick off. Ask anything you want, actually. I've got those there, but, you know. <laughs> do you want me to speak from this? <laughs> really, do you want me to ask these questions? <laughs> it's not complicated. <laughs> OK. Right back at you. <laughs> it would okay. appear, Blonhead, I've got the skills to pay the bills. <laughs> Great to have you here. Great to be here. <laughs> Try and hold it together. You're not Graham Norton. <laughs> no, I'm not Graham Norton. What do you think about fame? Well, I'm glad you've asked me that. A lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people, they get their first little taste of fame and they let it go to their heads. They end up in the Priory Clinic talking about themselves in the third person. Okay. Let me assure you, Jimmy Carr's not going to let that happen. <laughs> so, who would you most like to sleep with? Anyone living or dead? Anyone living. <laughs> This could take a while. <laughs> Which is your greatest regret? Well, they say that you should regret the things you, you have done, not the things you haven't. But my greatest regret is something that I didn't do. It's a, a girl called Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> What's your Sorry, words? do I look like a wife beater now? Because she's crying. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I, I think I might be giving her an orgasm. I'm not <laughs> I've never seen it before. I've got no frame of reference. No, don't worry, you're not. <laughs> I'll never go. Which words or phrases do you most overuse? Hello, I'm Jimmy Carr. All I'm saying is, when you think about it, can I park here? Is it in yet? <laughs> Where do you get your ideas from? I think it's the cerebellum, but it could be the frontal cortex. <laughs> could be. I'm not sure. Which book changed your life? Heidegger's Being and Nothingness. What is your most embarrassing Well, hang on, there's more to that. <laughs> <laughs> Feed line, punch line, then we move on. <laughs> OK, go for it. OK, what is your favourite record of all time? Well, it's a different question. <laughs> Go back to the book, damn it. OK. <laughs> what book changed your life? Heidegger's Being in Nothingness. Before I got that book, we had a wonky table in the kitchen. <laughs> what's, the <laughs> what's the worst heckle you've ever had? I was probably when I was doing a gig in Bristol. I told a joke, not a brilliant joke, but it was all right. I said, has anyone in here been caught thieving in the Middle East? Let's have a show of hands. <laughs> and a bloke about four rows back held up a hook, <laughs> properly Abu Hamza style. Oh, right, yeah. And I, to my eternal shame, I said, give me a big hand. I'm going to edit all this out. Well, your bits, yeah. <laughs> I put Smarties tubes on cat's legs and make them walk like a robot. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm really tense, I make it go down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> they get a bit confused. Yeah. What a cat looking confused is brilliant. Okay. Little face. What makes you angry? When I can't get the lid off the Valium. Okay. <laughs> Which historical figure do you most admire? Joan of Arc, lovely tits. <laughs> What's the one thing you'd like to do before you die? Kylie. <laughs> so predictable. <laughs> Any other questions of your own? <laughs> Any other questions of your own? Any questions? Any other questions of your own? Most people will just read that and then think of a question. <laughs> Well, 
So you're, uh, you're Irish, are you? <laughs> Imagine my surprise. I'm actually... Um, where are you from in Ireland? Dublin. Dublin. I'm actually what people refer to as a plastic paddy. Because I've got Irish parents and an Irish passport. But you were born and grew up in England. Well, no, I was born in Ireland, Irish passport, Irish parents. But I've got, and I've got, you know, Irish passport, everything Irish. But I speak like this and present myself in this way because I was educated in the UK. Just goes to show what you can do when you apply yourself. <laughs> Every time I speak to an Irish person now, I'm, I'm slightly saddened. I think, I think it doesn't have to be this way. Well, I think you've done a wonderful job, Blond... <laughs> Blondeer. Blonded. Thank you. Blonded. Uh, thanks very much for talking to me. Thank you very much indeed. Johnny, uh, Jimmy, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that was low, wasn't it? <laughs> Give her a big round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much. Thanks for having My girlfriend said she wanted me to tease her. I said, all right, fatty. <laughs> Things don't always work out the way you think. I always thought it was going to be my mum that would catch me masturbating. <laughs> Being you're shocked, imagine my surprise. <laughs> According to official statistics, one third of all accidents in the workplace go unreported. How on earth do they know? When I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend, and I used to think that he went everywhere with me, and that I could talk to him and he could hear me, and that he could grant me wishes and stuff. And then I grew up, and I stopped going to church. <laughs> oh, that seems to have divided the room somewhat. <laughs> there's two distinct groups there. There's people that thought that was funny, and then there's a larger group who will be going to heaven. <laughs> While we're on the subject of religion, I imagine there's quite a few people in here that go to Mass, or... Or wherever Protestants go. Hell, I'd imagine, I know. <laughs> Have you all seen the new Mel Gibson film? The Passion of the Christ. It's upset an awful lot of Christians. They're, very up, they're up in arms about it. He's, he's made a film about the life of Christ, but he's tacked on this silly Hollywood ending where the hero comes back at the end. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Does she love the little baby Jesus, or...? <laughs> Does she love the little baby Jesus or not? Is she, she going for a wee? Is it a wee or a poo? <laughs> Should we time her? <laughs> so it's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? When people say they hear voices in their heads, as opposed to where exactly? <laughs> Hearing voices in your legs. <laughs> That's properly mental. <laughs> I saw an advert for adult literacy classes in the newspaper. <laughs> there are any single men in this evening? Anyone single? You're, you're single. Well, don't, don't panic. I've got some advice for you. If you really like a girl and you ask her out and she says to you, I love you like a brother, suggest a weekend in Norfolk. <laughs> Unless you're from Norfolk, in which case it probably is your sister. <laughs> so are you from Norfolk? You don't look like you're from Norfolk. You're from Thetford in Norfolk. <laughs> and is that your sister, girlfriend, both? <laughs> Sorry, and you're here with your sister? <coughs> Not really, though. <laughs> Saturday night out, I'll take my sister. She's a, she's a looker. <laughs> Have you ever with the... <laughs> I'm only asking. Do you, think, do you think your sister's attractive, can I ask? <laughs> do, do you think she's attractive or not? She's OK. She's OK. Did you give her one? <laughs> <laughs> that was very low, sorry. What about you, love? <laughs> I can't believe that. He's from Norfolk. <laughs> and he's brought his sister. It could scarcely be better. <laughs> I'm amazed you didn't bring your mum. Did you split up? <laughs> oh, marvellous. 
<laughs> Imagine your family tree's a straight line, is it? <laughs> it's just a piece of timber. <coughs> Sorry. I may have misjudged this. It looks as if there's going to be a short fight after the gig. <laughs> which I imagine I'll be losing. Did she... <laughs> Do you think she got... bladder problems? Maybe some sort of yeast infection, I'm not... <laughs> we'll ask her when she comes back. <laughs> I just hope she hasn't got any vaginal difficulties. <laughs> it's a lovely word, though, isn't it, vaginal? <laughs> oh, clearly not. <laughs> I've got a friend that picked up two girls last week. I said they're like buses. He said, yeah, you wait ages and then two come along at once. I said, no, they are like buses. <laughs> Someone came up to me and complained about that joke a couple of weeks ago after a show. Quite a big boned girl. She said to me, I think you're fattest. I said, no, no, no. I think you're fattest. <laughs> Someone calls Admiral Insurance every six seconds for a quote. What a nutter. <laughs> Environmentalists tell us that every day an area the size of Wales is destroyed. Why is it never Wales? <laughs> so, are there Welsh people in this evening? You're from Wales? Well, don't, don't worry. Do you know what the most common crime is in Wales? No. Hang on, I've got to ask someone about her foo foo. <laughs> it's a long time for a pee, are you alright? You're fine. You sure? Is that better? Yeah. Bless you. Sorry, I was just talking to your friend about being from Wales. Do you know what the most common crime is in Wales? Have a guess. What well, guess? Sheep shagging? <laughs> well, that's rather insulting, isn't it? And to add insult to injury, you're wrong. It's not sheep shagging, it's actually ram raiding. The second most common crime is having sex with a minor. <laughs> if anyone's offended, just look for the other meaning. You'll be fine. <laughs> I bought my girlfriend a book called Cheap and Easy Vegetarian Cooking, which is ideal for her because not only is she a vegetarian... <laughs> she's reading a book at the moment called Women That Love Too Much, which I think could have the title shortened to sluts. <laughs> The reason old men use Viagra is not because they're impotent. It's because old women are so very ugly. <laughs> when it comes to the environment, it's not us, but our children and our children's children that will pay for our mistakes, which is a relief. <laughs> no matter how much you give a homeless person for a cup of tea, you never get that tea. Throwing acid is wrong, in some people's eyes. <laughs> I went up to the airport information desk. I said, how many airports are there in the world? <laughs> she said, I don't know. I went up to the check-in desk. The girl said to me, window seat or aisle? I said, window seat or you're what? Are you threatening me? <laughs> she said, no, 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 calm down, calm down. Window seat or aisle? I said, I'll have a seat. I bought one of those round-the-world air tickets, £1,200, amazing value. 37 hours later, I arrived back at Heathrow. <laughs> A lot of people say modern art is pretentious, but I look at it like this. <laughs> boxers, boxers don't have sex before a fight. Do you know what that is? They don't fancy each other. <laughs> if you eat a lot of spicy food, you can damage your sense of taste. When I was in India last year, I was listening to a lot of Michael Bolton. <laughs> Every year in this country, thousands of dogs are needlessly and pointlessly destroyed. Every night, hundreds of homeless people go hungry. <laughs> All I'm saying is... <laughs> it wouldn't happen in Korea. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to recommend Korean food to each and every one of you. Their cuisine is delicious, their delicacies. They're the dog's bollocks. <laughs> On holiday, I went walking in the lakes. It's called swimming. <laughs> and while I was there, I met a very beautiful girl, and I fell in love, but she was going out with a friend of mine, so I had to hide the way I felt. That's not easy wearing Speedos. 
Men, men tend to fall asleep directly after sex. All I'm saying is, maybe for women, put a bit more into it. <laughs> Sorry, that's not meant to be misogynistic in any way. I was reading in Tits and Arse magazine. <laughs> Very interesting and informative article. It was about the difficulties of asking your partner for anal sex. It was entitled, what if she takes it the wrong way? <laughs> Sorry, I can see you're shifting uncomfortably there. I didn't, mean to, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sure whatever you decide about anal sex, I'm sure he'll be right behind you. It's easier to get forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Just thought I'd slip that in. <laughs> if you had to choose between saving your own life and saving the life of a loved one, most people agree, make a brilliant game show. <laughs> Mother always said, if you haven't got anything nice to say, fuck off. <laughs> I read an interview with Margaret Thatcher a couple of years ago, and in it she was talking about her funeral. She said, I don't want my funeral to be a morbid affair. I want it to be a celebration. I thought, well, you won't be disappointed, love. <laughs> My sister had a baby, I went to see her. She said, do you want to wind him? I said, I'll give him a dead leg, shall I? <laughs> Cats have got nine lives, which makes them ideal for experimentation. <laughs> a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. So do be careful at the office party. Watching sex on telly with mum and dad, that's embarrassing. I didn't even know they knew to use the camcorder. <laughs> a very common male fantasy is to have two women at the same time. Want to cook, want to clean. Right? <laughs> Easy there, I'm joking. They want to fuck them. <laughs> I live quite near a special needs school. There's a sign outside. It says, slow children. I thought, well, that can't do much for their self-esteem. <laughs> but look on the positive side, of course, they can't read it. <laughs> now, I'm afraid that's almost all I've got time for this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there's just one thing left that I'd like to do, which is go through some Jimmy Carr merchandise, if we could just lock the doors. <laughs> I've gone for some comedy T-shirts, which I'd, I'd like to show you. They're just up here. You, see, you know, the comedy T-shirt, it's, it's an underutilised medium, in my opinion. Hang on. Perfectly normal thing to do. <laughs> Sell a bit away, you know, the Rolling Stones do it, why not me? Uh, this is the first one that I did, it's uh, I'm a Stupid, what do you think? It says I'm a Stupid, so you can wear it, and the person next to you, mm. <laughs> you know, I'm a It's got jimmycar.com on the sleeve, I'm a Stupid. On the back it says, the National Association of Special Needs Carers. <laughs> My girlfriend went on a UN-sponsored trip to investigate child labour in the Far East. <laughs> and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. <laughs> See, there's a very serious issue there. Children as young as 10 are working, you know, 80 hours a week in sweatshops in the Far East, stitching trainers. I wouldn't mind, but it's a workmanship that suffers. <laughs> this one's rather predictable, but it's kind of fun as well. It's the Christian Alliance Against Bad Language. Can fuck off. <laughs> Got another religious one now, but for a reason. This is the best-selling T-shirt ever in the world. Jesus loves you. It's the most popular T-shirt ever. Jesus loves you. He's not in love with you. <laughs> I was going to go for, he's not fussy about looks. <laughs> I thought, no. Incidentally, if we're all God's children, what's so special about Jesus? <laughs> this is love hurts. It's a nice sentiment, isn't it? Love hurts. It sort of shows a sensitive side. Love hurts. Try a lubricated finger. <laughs> this takes a little bit of explaining. It's True Love Waits is the slogan. It's the slogan of the Promise Keepers. They're an organisation in America that believe in holding on to their virginity and chastity until marriage. Britney Spears was a member. I think there's some footage of her leaving on the internet. <laughs> anyway, their slogan's True Love Waits. I thought, uh, True Love Waits is such a lovely slogan. It deserves a T-shirt. True Love Waits. Pulls out and comes on her tits. <laughs> Well, I imagine you're getting the hang of this by now, so, you know, try and guess this one. It's see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. What do you think? No idea? See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Rohypnol.
Actually, there was, there, was a, there was a story in the paper earlier this year. There was a story about an Englishman arrested in Iron Apple for taking advantage of three girls by putting Rohypnol in their drinks. What's the world coming to? In Iron Apple. <laughs> You're telling me Rohypnol is now cheaper than three Bacardi Breezers? <laughs> Now this one, this is, a, this is a picture that the man on my right, your left, is, is on fire. Can you all see that? He's on fire. <coughs> Special Olympics torch arrives. <laughs> I did briefly consider the phrase flame retarded. I thought, no. <laughs> Let's not get out of hand. Well, this is the last one I'm going to leave you with this, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure talking to you this evening. Obviously, this is a, it's a lovely T-shirt. World's best dad. I don't know, are there any dads in? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this may be a nice thing for you to wear around the house. World's best dad. Nice, you wear that with pride. World's best dad. I fucked your mum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been Jimmy Carr. You've been absolutely lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you. I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you, if you've ever had kind of quite a good day at work, you've got everything done that you need to get done, it's all gone well, and then you've been kept behind at the end for some reason. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. <laughs> right, the encore. Um, whew, I suppose I'd better do some more jokes. Really? Uh, how many do you want? <laughs> ten. I could do ten. Should we count them down? <laughs> yeah, all right, why don't we count them down? Fuck it. I've got a friend, she's got a theory. She reckons the way to drive a man wild with desire to nibble on his earlobes for hours and hours. I think it's bollocks. <laughs> One. One. <laughs> Hang on, all together or not at all? One. <laughs> oh, we've got to do this ten times now. <laughs> I've talked myself into a corner. Right. My mum told me the best time to ask my dad for anything was during sex. Not the best advice I've ever been given. <laughs> I burst in through the bedroom door, saying, can I have a new bike? <laughs> he was very upset. His secretary was surprisingly nice about it. <laughs> I got the bike. <laughs> Two. <laughs> I went to the races last week with a friend. He said, don't back the heavily handicapped horses. <laughs> I said, I'm not a fucking idiot. <laughs> I know that for them, it's all about taking part. In their own way, they're all winners. <laughs> In Pizza Express, you can now get garlic bread with cheese and tomato. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a pizza. <laughs> well, four and fuck off. <laughs> Not you. A lot of people say that men with big flashy cars have got tiny cocks. Am I the only one that reckons that women with spasses and people carriers? <laughs> well, clearly not. <laughs> there was a worrying moment there where I thought I was going to have to say bucket fanny. <laughs> Thankfully, that's been avoided. <laughs> Ladies, if you get a burning sensation when you pee, it could be one of three things. It could be cystitis, it could be a bushfire, <laughs> or it could be someone's talking about your vagina. Six. When it comes to charity, a lot of people will stop at nothing. <laughs> I saw a charity appeal in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago and it read, Little Zuki has to walk 15 miles every day just to fetch water. And I couldn't help thinking, she should move. <laughs> I've sponsored a child in Africa. She's got the Jimmy Carr T-shirt, the Jimmy Carr hat. <laughs> but I worry, is it doing any good? <laughs> I've not got any more bookings.
I was out last week collecting for a sponsored walk. In the end, I managed to raise so much money, I was able to afford a taxi. <laughs> I, t I tell you what, just before, just before the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we've, we've had a fun night, haven't we? Yeah. That was quite a good laugh, I thought. I enjoyed myself. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's been really nice. Thank you very much indeed for coming out. I, you know, I don't want to bring you down at the end of the show, but I'd like to, like to just tell you this. It's quite a frightening fact. I'd just like to end on this. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but if you took all the money that we in the West spend on food in just one week, you could feed the third world for one year. Now, I don't know about you good people, but I can't help feeling. We're being overcharged for our groceries. <laughs> I've been Jimmy Carr. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know if that's ever happened to any of you, if you've ever had kind of quite a good day at work, you've got everything done that you need to get done, it's all gone well, and then you've been kept behind at the end for some reason. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much. <laughs> right, the encore. Um, whew, I suppose I'd better do some more jokes. Really? Uh, how many do you want? <laughs> ten, I could do ten. Should we count them down? <laughs> yeah, all right, why don't we count them down? Fuck it. I've got a friend, she's got a theory. She reckons the way to drive a man wild with desire to nibble on his earlobes for hours and hours. I think it's bollocks. <laughs> One. One. <laughs> Hang on, all together or not at all? One. <laughs> oh, we've got to do this ten times now. <laughs> I've talked myself into a corner. Right. My mum told me the best time to ask my dad for anything was during sex. <laughs> Not the best advice I've ever been given. <laughs> I burst in through the bedroom door saying, can I have a new bike? <laughs> he was very upset. His secretary was surprisingly nice about it. <laughs> I got the bike. <laughs> Two. <laughs> I went to the races last week with a friend. He said, don't back the heavily handicapped horses. <laughs> I said, I'm not a fucking idiot. <laughs> I know that for them, it's all about taking part. In their own way, they're all winners. <laughs> In Pizza Express, you can now get garlic bread with cheese and tomato. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a pizza. <laughs> well, four and fuck off. <laughs> Not you. A lot of people say that men with big flashy cars have got tiny cocks. Am I the only one that reckons that women with spasses and people carriers? <laughs> well, clearly not. There was a worrying moment there where I thought I was going to have to say bucket fanny. <laughs> Thankfully, that's been avoided. <laughs> Ladies, if you get a burning sensation when you pee, it could be one of three things. It could be cystitis, it could be a bushfire, <laughs> or it could be someone's talking about your vagina. Yes. <laughs> when it comes to charity, a lot of people will stop at nothing. <laughs> I saw a charity appeal in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago and it read, Little Zuki has to walk 15 miles every day just to fetch water. And I couldn't help thinking, she should move. <laughs> yes. 
I've sponsored a child in Africa. She's got the Jimmy Carr T-shirt, the Jimmy Carr hat. <laughs> but I worry, is it doing any good? <laughs> I've not got any more bookings. <laughs> I was out last week collecting for a sponsored walk. In the end, I managed to raise so much money, I was able to afford a taxi. <laughs> I, t I tell you what, just before, just before the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we've, we've had a fun night, haven't we? Yeah. That was quite a good laugh, I thought. I enjoyed myself. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's been really nice. Thank you very much indeed for coming out. I, you know, I don't want to bring you down at the end of the show, but I'd like to, like to just tell you this. It's quite a frightening fact. I'd just like to end on this. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but if you took all the money that we in the West spend on food in just one week, you could feed the third world for one year. Now, I don't know about you good people, but I can't help feeling. We're being overcharged for our groceries. <laughs> I've been Jimmy Carr. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>